The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap is as needlessly complicated as it is mind-blowingly simple. There you go. Video done. Okay, I suppose I should back that up. The Minish Cap is a smaller game in most respects. It has a shorter main campaign, a shorter dungeon count, a dangerously small map. None of these are reasons I dislike it. It is built in such a way to get a lot of mileage out of that small map, packing a multitude of side quests and rewards behind puzzles that see you turning small and going about normal tasks from an alternate perspective. For instance, you can walk into a house while you're normal sized, talk to the NPCs, fuse some kinstones, and you can again enter that same house as a small boy, journey to the attic, and talk to Picori. This is definitely the strongest and most developed mechanic within the Minish Cap. It's a mechanic that affects overworld progression in a dramatic way like the time travel and season switching in the Oracle games, but it's also a mechanic that has a more obvious effect on progression. When you become small, there are places you can't go thanks to paving, shallow water, and rocks embedded within the ground, all of which can be walked over with little to no effort when you're bigger. As soon as the second dungeon, Minish Cap has you switching back and forth, forcing you to think about some of the same rooms in different ways as it recontextualizes enemies and hazards that were previously pushovers. In many sections, this switching is merely novel. One of the bosses has you entering its core to take it out from the inside, while other moments are more puzzling. These small entrances are genius because they clue you into the fact that you'll have to turn small at some point, you're forced to figure out where and how you can do that to progress. This happens more in the overworld than it does in dungeons, more on that later, specifically within the main town. There's a section in the northwestern quadrant that teases you for a very long time. Once you reach a certain progression trigger, you can finally open this pathway. Entering this house, moving up the chimney to the next house, past the cats, into the sewers, until you're on your way to the next dungeon. It's an excellent method to present fresh puzzles to players new and old. The problems come in when this mechanic seems to be the only fully formed and necessary mechanic within its run. Everything about this stretch of small exploration is interesting, except the method by which you unlock it. After obtaining the Cane of Pachi within the second dungeon, you are provided a proverbial key to open new doors. I could flip over these pots inside the houses and finally explore the town as a smaller version of myself. I soon realized, however, that a lot of what I could now do was pointless even though I figured out for myself that I could put out the fire in this guy's house with a bottle and then mosey on over to his girlfriend's house through the chimney, there was nothing I could actually do here since the story didn't yet gift me with the correct trigger. This was all to obtain a book taken from the library, a book that is absent until the very point it's needed, rendering this side activity pointless. It was always for the main quest, it was just dressed up to provide you the illusion of freedom. What makes it worse is that Minish Cap doesn't match the level of sophistication in its puzzle solving that the previous two games by the same team were able to accomplish. In fact, many of the town's secrets were obvious to me as soon as I walked in, but because they didn't yield any rewards, they ceased to be fulfilling in their own right. All these puzzles serve are to be mindless stepping stones to the next objective. This is a hard issue to grapple with, because I've argued that Zelda benefits from its strong ties to Metroidvania-like design, and what I'm complaining about here could be seen as exactly that. You need a specific item to do a specific thing, but in this instance it feels… overcomplicated. Why are you even allowed to do some of the things you're allowed to do if you can never follow through on them, if the main quest is just going to make you do it? It's not like ages where I was often stumped about how to do something, it's a feeling more akin to frustration. I know I can do something here, but the game strings me along until it slaps me in the face and calls me stupid for thinking I can even accomplish something here in the first place. If it was gonna lock all this main progression stuff away, it may as well have introduced more roadblocks that prevented me from ever interacting with them in the first place. Just put an NPC in the way or something. Hell, the game itself does this at multiple points anyway. Again, I'm not gonna like that what I can or can't do feels arbitrary, but at least I'm not being teased at the promise of something more, only for it to eventually just be a stepping stone to the next dungeon instead of a cool reward. This irritates me so much because the actual way you find secret treasures is through the kinstone system. Oh dear lord. I have racked my brain on this for hours. I do not understand the point of it. I seriously do not get it. The Oracle games had loot-based RNG drop tables for the rings, but that made sense because the rings affected Link in subtle ways that changed the gameplay. They felt like a cool bonus on top of the static side rewards. 
Kinstones are dropped somewhat randomly throughout the world, especially when found in grass or upon killing enemies. You can find them in chests, where assumedly they are static rewards. The way the system works is that there are different colors of kinstones, which each have different shapes. Green kinstones are the most common and usually yield a generic rupee reward. Blue kinstones are a rarer variant of green and aid in some essential side quests. Red kinstones can only be found in treasure chests, but yield the best rewards like heart pieces and other side items. The system on the surface is sound. You fuse kinstones with NPCs and they reveal secret locations or further side quests. Sometimes vines will disappear so you can use a tree entrance, or a chest will spawn, or an NPC will move. Basically anything can happen when you fuse a kinstone. I guess that's the appeal here. You never know what's going to happen until you fuse, and there are handy map indicators to show you where you've unlocked points of interest. However, when you begin to realize just how many NPCs are in the Minish Cap, spread out across the map, tracking everyone down becomes an ordeal. Okay, so there are a hundred kinstone fusions, and not all of them matter. It's hard to even figure out which actually do matter until you're already fusing with an NPC. If the thought bubble above their head is a rupee, it isn't important. If it's a heart, it's definitely important. And if it's a question mark, well, I've had mixed results. Usually, if it's a green fusion, it'll be less important, but by the time you actually reach that NPC and thus the fusion screen, you might as well just fuse anyway, right? all to find a golden enemy that drops some money. Inevitably, you're gonna have this moment where you run around the entire map, spamming the L button on everyone to see what happens. There are 100 of these fusions that all make you do something afterward. Many of the fusions open an area with a reward, one that you have to go travel to. Why do you have to find an NPC, fuse with them, and open the way to a side cave with a cool reward. Why is it that after obtaining the digging mitts, I can't simply walk to all of those special areas and dig through them? There are several dirt caves that are sitting on top of deep water, and you're only able to access them upon fusing a kinstone and magically being able to stand on the shallow water. Does this not feel overbearing? It frustrates the hell out of me. There are little quirks to the system, like some NPCs having multiple fusions you can only trigger by leaving the room and coming back. The ghost in Northern Hyrule has an important fusion hidden behind a relatively unimportant fusion. Why? I have no idea! You don't have any in-game list to track the NPCs you've met, where to find them, or even what kinstones you need to fuse. I mean, imagine Majora's Mask without the bomber's notebook. The player is simply expected to cram all of this into their brains, to remember where every single NPC is to eventually fuse with their dumb stone. Since there are so many of them, you'll inevitably run out at some point. I remember trying to fuse with the tingles for that giant chest with the magic boomerang, but I ran out of a very specific green kinstone. It took an eternity to get the shape I wanted. That's right, I had to go grind in Zelda. Fancy that. There's even a minigame house that opens where the owner explicitly states that it's a very helpful way to get kinstones. When you have to make a minigame where the incentive for playing is to grind out kinstones, I feel as though the system is already lost. What then does the system matter? I can kind of see the appeal for side objectives. The Goron Rock Cave is a good example. After getting the mole mitts, you can fuse blue kinstones with markings in several dirt walls, and doing this will add a Goron to the pile. This incentivizes overworld exploration with the digging mitts while also furthering an interesting side quest with useful rewards. It still feels needlessly complicated, but at least you're getting good rewards out of it. In stark contrast to fusing with an NPC, watching some vines disappear, walking to that map quadrant, walking inside the tree, and picking up a piece of heart. What about this process is more fulfilling than using the lantern to burn the vines? Why add this extra step? I just don't get it. Because you can't track this large list of NPCs, you're just gonna have to look up a goddamn kinstone guide like I did. You think I'm gonna remember the names of these people? They all have names, which is a step above other Zelda games, but was it a necessary one? You don't talk or do anything memorable with them, so I don't know how you're supposed to remember all their goddamn names without a book to categorize them. Jesus Christ, why is there not an in-game tracker? The kinstones drove me insane. It got to the point where I'd open a chest, find a kinstone, and say to myself, Yep, another kinstone. Beautiful. 
Which is odd, as on the surface, I can see that the kinstones are supposed to serve the same function as the rings, giving you a bigger incentive to explore by offering the player rewards that have the potential to be very rare, all from relatively mundane activities. While kinstones are more valuable than money in several instances, their importance feels artificially inflated. It's further compounded by the second collectible, the Mysterious Shells. They're set up the same way, you get them through predetermined chests and as RNG drops from grass, rocks, and enemies. They allow you to obtain figures in town. The more you trade, the greater your odds of getting a new figure. This increases by one shell every new figure you obtain. At first, you only need one shell to guarantee a new figure, but after a couple trades, you'll need 12 for a 100% chance at a new figure, and then after more trades, you'll need 20, and then 50, and then 200. I've been told the most efficient way to do this, to save the most resources, is to just keep putting one shell in until you reach lower percentages like 20 or 30%. While this is a sound strategy, the speed at which you obtain figures borders on parity. You can't make multiple trades at once. If you want to initiate a trade, you have to walk up to the trade person, spam through his dialogue, set the amount of shells you want to trade, watch an animation of the figure dropping out of the machine, watch the figure appear, read the title of the figure, press B, wade through even more useless dialogue, and start again. Okay, so big deal, right? They're just figures. You don't have to go after them if you don't want. They're like the figures in Wind Waker. Yeah, except there's a heart piece hidden behind this side quest. You need all of the figures to get the heart piece, not even a heart container, a heart piece. There are 130 figures, meaning that, assuming you have the best RNG, you'll have to do the trades 130 times. And that is assuming you only give him one shell all of those times. Realistically, you'll want to raise the odds eventually, and since you can only carry 999 shells for some reason, at some point you'll have to go get more shells. Even if you don't want to do this side quest, a lot of the more obscure dungeon rewards are mysterious shells, and you can't carry more of them if you've hit the cap. You might as well just go trade some to clear out your inventory. None of it would even bother me if you could just do multiple trades at once and be done with it. There is no defending this. I can't believe they hid a heart piece behind this. This is probably the worst heart piece in the entire series that I've played anyway. I don't know, I still got four more games to go. At least other somewhat obnoxious side quests in the series weren't strictly necessary and had a hint of fun to them. The Golden Skultula and Ocarina of Time wore out their welcome at some point, but after collecting a certain amount, you could drop the side quest since the rewards afterward were relatively unimportant. Same with the Poe Souls in Twilight Princess, the Sea Charts in The Wind Waker, and the Secret Seashells in Link's Awakening. Not only did all four of these side quests require a lot of work to collect, they didn't all need to be collected for heart pieces or new items. Most of them would reward more rupees. Some of them, like the Secret Seashells, don't net you any rewards for collecting them all. But that's precisely why I hate the specificity of the figurine side quest. You must collect every figure for the heart piece reward, meaning you must collect the necessary amount of mysterious seashells for the final reward. You also must put up with the RNG required to unlock those figurines in the first place. It is a secondary currency that fails on almost every level, and making them rewards for well-hidden secrets within dungeons feels like a sick joke. What gets me is that this could have been a more interesting side quest. By their very nature, the mysterious seashells are a currency, one that could have been put toward a secondary marketplace. Kilton, the traveling merchant from Breath of the Wild, is the only traveling merchant that deals in an alternate currency, monster parts. You get monster parts by defeating monsters, and you can use them for a variety of purposes, though the one important to this discussion is the value placed upon these items by Kilton. You can use them to buy items that aren't strictly necessary, but tweak the game ever so slightly. He sells you disguises so that certain enemies won't attack you, extract to use in a few cooking recipes, and a set of dark link armor that increases your speed at night. Most of this stuff is dumb, but they are just useful enough to be considered valuable by the player, and by extension, for the player to put more value on monster parts. No such exchange occurs with either the mysterious seashells or the kinstones. Both systems are needlessly complicated and only feel necessary because they hide incredibly useful items behind their exchanges. 
It is not a two-way system. The reward is alluring, but not the method by which you obtain the reward. What this means for the Minish Cap is that all it can reasonably rely on is its main progression. The dungeons, the story, the combat, all of which embody that mind-blowing simplicity I mentioned at the beginning. Admittedly, it's not all doom and gloom in this department. Often the path to a dungeon is fully explorable all at once and becomes its own mini-dungeon as a tension build up to the actual dungeon. Mount Krenel, for instance, has to be figured out beforehand. You need the ability to climb, which you can only get from a Deku scrub you find behind a bombable wall that is subtly telegraphed. You can only get there after you figure out where the mineral water is so that you can grow a vine and climb it. It's a winding set of caves, enemies, and mini-puzzles leading to the next dungeon. It's the same for practically every dungeon except the first. Even the Temple of Droplets has the lead-up within the town itself that acts as its own preamble. You go through each temple in the order the game drives you towards, which is nothing new in Zelda. Link's Awakening did it, Oracle of Ages did it, and while Oracle of Seasons slightly broke away from that format, it only did so for a few dungeons. As time has gone on, I think I've become less concerned with this linear progression as long as it's done well. Minish Cap handles it in an interesting way, making that linear progression a challenge in and of itself. The reason I was so fed up with it in The Wind Waker was because it was a huge open world just begging to be explored, yet the game insisted on still having a linear progression. It wasn't a challenging linear progression either, since the path to a dungeon was simply the act of sailing to a dungeon. If making your way through the game doesn't feel fun, why not instead make it a non-linear, discoverable progression? Minish Cap doesn't need to have a discoverable progression to be fun, though it does sometimes suffer from obtuse progression flags. Moments like not being able to unlock the Pegasus Boots until you actually go to the swamp and realize you can't cross it. Or that the library doesn't open until you talk to this Minish in Lake Hylia. Why the game feels the need to do this stuff is beyond me and it complicates progression way too much. I had moments where I was running around attempting to figure out what I had to do next, only to realize the game needed me to go trigger an ultra needlessly specific progression flag before I could go do it. Again, I have no problem with linear design, I often think it's executed well here, just in ever smaller quantities. Unfortunately, much like The Wind Waker, Minish Cap is a set of dungeons that left me wanting more. It's not just that there are a smaller amount of dungeons. Hell, I love Majora's Mask, and you don't see me complaining because all four of those dungeons are expertly crafted, with a variety of side caves and mini dungeons to fill that void. Minish Cap is a set of six dungeons, and a few of them are admittedly great. The Fortress of Winds and the Palace of Winds are diametrically opposed in their dungeon philosophies, but that's okay, because I like them both for wildly different reasons. I love the Fortress of Winds for allowing a bunch of pathways to explore at the start. As Boskis aptly put it, a find the path dungeon. One that has a lot of small keys and progression puzzles, many of them making unique use of the size shifting mechanic. Turning small so you can walk inside the Armos and power them on or off is a really cool way to interact with a fairly standard Zelda enemy. The boss, as mentioned earlier, takes this concept and runs with it, a fantastic, slightly confusing dungeon that is a joy to figure out. The Palace of Winds, on the other hand, is a follow-the-path dungeon. You'll be hard-pressed to get lost in here. It's mostly a giant linear path with combat encounters and mini-puzzles. I love the dungeon mostly because it looks, sounds, and feels fun to clear. You get the rock's cape and solve a lot of action-based puzzles. It's basically the same reason I loved many of the dungeons in Oracle of Seasons, despite them feeling less complicated overall. The boss makes really, really good use of the rock's cape and your clone sword. Jumping from these flying manta rays, trying to create the right clones in the right areas to hit the eyes at the same time, while also taking care to avoid the manta rays flying at you and the projectiles they shoot. You have to manage both yourself and your clones so that they don't all disappear. It's arguably the best boss in Minish Cap next to Vati. I also have a very strange, specific fetish for things that are... in the sky? Maybe that's why I have a fondness for Skyward Sword that I'll never fully be able to explain. I love the Palace of Winds for the same reasons I love the city in the sky. I fully acknowledge they are shallow and important areas, but they make up for it with their aesthetic appeal. Who could argue with this serene backing? Dark Hyrule Castle is a nice blend of both ideas, presenting tough challenges that make use of your dungeon items in an interesting way, with mini-bosses that test your swordplay. The Dark Nuts emulate their Wind Waker appearances, except this time there aren't magical triangle presses to do the work for you. 
Instead, you have to dodge their strikes and follow up with your own counterattacks to get the job done. It gives you a reason to use your shield, an item I was hard-pressed to ever use even in Oracle of Seasons. You obtain a wide variety of sword skills to help you in this, one that even allows you to perform a helm splitter of your own volition when pairing the rock's cape with the sword, refreshing to pull off the helm splitter without a reaction command. This dungeon is quite possibly my favorite track in the game, a remix of the Hyrule Castle theme from A Link to the Past that makes me quiver. It has some challenging puzzles surrounding the Four Swords clone mechanic, tough enemies, I love the Dark Castle theme, I have a soft spot for games that end on a warped version of a previously peaceful sanctuary. That's kinda why I loved the finale of Bowser's Inside Story. How often do you get to fully explore the castle in the same context as Bowser's Castle? Hyrule Castle has the same effect. What Vati does to it is surprising enough, but to see all these purple clouds and this gosh damn music... Oh my god, I don't know why I love this music so much! You might call it a fetish. I can see that there are great dungeons here. They blur the line between find the path and follow the path, each giving a different variety of puzzles to solve that play with the central size shifting gimmick, a set of fun enemies to fight not dissimilar to the ones in the Oracle games, and a moderately challenging set of bosses, including Vati, who makes great use of the clone mechanic and is quite challenging to boot. When you consider that there are two halves to every coin in this game, the weaknesses become even more glaring. The Temple of Droplets, again, great music. Why does this game have such outstanding music all of a sudden? Real quick, pause, I actually want to comment on this. Link's Awakening and the Oracle games had great soundtracks, I concede that, but Minish Cap takes this to another level. I don't know what it is about these compositions, but they often elicit genuine emotion out of me on a level that I've only ever previously run into with games that I have nostalgia for. You know what I mean? Listen to the Temple of Droplets. It's so calm, so soothing, but has such an ancient, lost relic-like feel to it. I'm exploring an ancient Minish ruin, I feel that. It's sad that the act of exploring it can't do this for me in the same way. As soon as you get in, you already have your hands on the boss key, and you use it at the start of the dungeon. I panicked a little when this first happened, but turns out it's just a cheeky way to subvert the trope since you still have a long way to go. What you have to do is get the light from above to shine on a frozen Octorok. You do this by pushing levers on both sides of the room, but you can only get to those levers by taking one predetermined path. Certainly there are mildly tricky puzzles here and there, though I largely found myself going through the motions. One of the mini-bosses is just a recycled main boss of the past, with the only interesting shake-up being that it sparks electricity sometimes. Woo, it's still just a couple clicks of the gust jar away from death, but alright Minish Cap. It actually reuses quite a bit from that first dungeon, that wiggler-like boss, the lily pad water traversal, but it doesn't do a whole lot to transform those mechanics. It mostly feels like they're just, well, recycled. In fairness, the Wigglers are thrown at you with ice physics, and then again in a dimly lit 2v1, but I don't quite think those were enough to use them again. The best this dungeon has to offer are a few block-pushing puzzles on ice. One of them even has two solutions I found out on stream. Kinda neat. I also figured out that holding down the L button prevents Link from entering doors, and because of a wacky control mapping error in my emulator settings that made the game think I was holding down the L button eternally, we all thought I had tripped anti-piracy measures. We all wasted an hour of our time troubleshooting this bizarre problem, and I never would have even known this hidden function of the L button if I hadn't streamed it. It's still on my channel, just go to the Stream Archive playlist if you're interested. I promised Chad I would bring this up in the video, and I had no better segue. What were we talking about again? Oh right, bad dungeon talks. The Octorok boss is alright, you hit his rock back at him and light his tail on fire, all the while contending with ice physics. It's not awful, not by a long shot, there have certainly been worse bosses. It's just not very... exciting? It is pretty memorable, I do love how a few of the bosses are just normal sized enemies. That's cute but I don't feel like that cute subversion was taken very far at all in a gameplay sense. The green choo-choo, again, is a couple clicks of the gust jar away from death. You don't have to do much of anything at all to down it, and it exists within a very simple dungeon, one that Ezlo still has to guide you through for whatever reason. I guess kids play Zelda too. The most that concept is taken is in the Fortress of Winds boss fight, where you take on a robot by bashing its insides. Even then, it's a huge ball of missed potential. 
I expected something a little grander, maybe exploring a dungeon that itself is the boss fight, to take advantage of the idea that you're turning smaller. What if one of the dungeons was the inside of an Armos? Instead of the simple ladder that takes you to a switch to turn them on or off, imagine there was a set of rooms, confusing by nature of being clockwork machinations, fighting off bugs that had slithered into the core. Instead, there are multiple dungeons that are explored by Link at normal size. A mineshaft, ancient ruins, a sky temple. The only two dungeons that are small in size are both ancient Minish temples. Those are the only ideas worth exploring, I guess. The Cave of Flames is almost no different from any other Zelda dungeon. The funny minecart traversal can't mask the fact that it has almost nothing interesting to call its own. Sometimes you have to turn small to move forward, but it's not often you have to think about when to do that, or that the entire dungeon will take advantage of it. There'll be a place to turn small right next to the path forward, and since many of these dungeons can be broken down into linear pathways, it's no surprise that this cave got really boring really fast. Some of the puzzles were painfully surface level. Hit these enemies so that they turn into a ball, throw them into some holes, pull chest pegs into holes, fly across some tornadoes, the depth perception is a little wonky, but there's rarely anything to actually avoid in these sections. You just have to go wherever you have to go. They appear so frequently that it almost feels more like a flex than a well-considered mechanic. Look at how cool we can make this look on the Game Boy Advance! At least the Palace of Winds and Dark Hyrule Castle place some obstacles in the way, even if they don't tend to be threatening. Perhaps that's the most disappointing thing about the weaker dungeons. I felt like I was touring nice-looking vistas and not much else. I was walking down endless tunnels with a few vaguely stimulating puzzles until I fought a boss and left to go do more interesting things that I then remembered were needlessly complicated. You can kinda see the cycle starting. It's such a shame because they all have fantastic music, I love their atmospheres. Coming off the graphically and musically limited Game Boy Color titles, it feels so good to play something like the Minish Cap. One that can add a lot of graphical and musical flourish to otherwise by the numbers dungeon design. Really, if the Palace of Winds wasn't on the GBA, if Minish Cap was on the Game Boy Color or something, it'd be less special to me. And when your game's strengths feel that surface level, there's probably a deeper issue at play. They're less like labyrinths that I can get lost in, and still less like a series of rooms you can adventure your way through, more like a linear path threaded along by an appetizing carrot dangling from a rope. Even the dungeon items are a double-edged sword. The Gus Jar and Cane of Pachi are highlights, I haven't seen much like these items in the entire series besides the Gust Bellows, which came after Minish Cap anyway. The Gust Jar is used for a variety of purposes, like moving lily pads and removing obstacles, while the Cane of Pachi flips over objects and allows Link to rocket out of holes in the ground. However, they are beyond situational in their use. You still use them more often than the 3D titles are willing to use theirs, but not nearly as much as Link's Awakening or the Oracle games. Though the Gust Jar is used later on at a few points, namely within the Temple of Droplets, it doesn't get much use anywhere else. Many of its uses don't feel fun either. The third time you jump onto this lily pad, the repetition sets in harder than the morning after New Year's Eve especially in the Temple of Droplets where you have to grab the lily pad again and do the section over. Also, you can burn an ice block with your newly acquired lantern for an essential kinstone piece. The lantern and the cane of Pachi similarly have very few use cases outside of flipping a jar so you can turn tiny or lighting dark rooms. The digging mitts sport perhaps the most utility of all the new items, allowing Link to explore dirt caves, except it's definitely an item that rings of progression key. There is next to nothing you can do with it besides exploring designated dirt walls, even if you do use it often. Not exactly the most exciting new set of items, but I do appreciate that they are new. At least this time the lantern doesn't drain a meter or something. Never understood why Zelda games did that. The items that tend to work better are often the tried and true. The Pegasus boots, the Rock's cape, the bow, yada yada. I think at this point Capcom had a pretty good grasp on the items that did and did not work. It doesn't quite reach the Oracle games in terms of frequent use, but it does enough that I'm happy with the new additions. It's just a shame that so much about Minish Cap falls short of what I initially expected of it. Some of the things it delivered on well are fairly superfluous. It looks good, it sounds good, and the size-shifting mechanic is well utilized. Otherwise, it has a set of mechanics that feel either half-baked, or in some cases, still sitting in the freezer. 
Some dungeons are fun, some of them feel like a slog, some of the dungeon items are great, some of them feel a little useless, and the kinstones paired with the mysterious seashells are just an overly complicated way to achieve something the Zelda games haven't had a problem achieving in the past at all, not even the previous games that Capcom already made. I think I can best sum this up by diving into the story, a story that I feel is painfully underwritten. I think the reason the Capcom Zelda games have underwhelming stories is because Flagship developed scenarios for the games before production even began. So what Capcom were working off of were simply scenarios. I think. Please correct me if that's wrong. It would explain why the Oracle games didn't have such a great story or an interesting set of antagonists like most other Zeldas manage. Unsurprisingly, the Minish Cap is a standard tale with some new characters. The Picori are an interesting addition to the series lore. I think they're cute, and the main antagonist is a Picori. Even Ezlo is a Picori. At some point, Ezlo explains that Vati picked up a hat that he'd made, one that gives him the power to... shape reality. Yeah, it's never really fully explained, but it must be true because Zelda uses it to bring everyone back from the dead and save the entire kingdom. Vati uses it to become human-sized and have powerful magic. He seems interested in a power known as the Light Force, but can't use the hat to find it for him. It doesn't delve far enough into the relationship between Ezlo and Vati for me to connect with that conflict. They don't go into detail about why Vati fell to darkness. As Ezlo puts it, he became enchanted by the wickedness of the hearts of men. What does this mean? Seriously. What is even being said here? Vati is the evil bad guy who put on the bad hat, and you have to stop him. Granted, he gets more screen time than the villains of the Oracle games did, and he makes a lot of progress, but Varen also made a lot of progress. That didn't make her a great villain in my eyes. Vati doesn't scare me or sexually intrigue me the same way Girahim could. He's just a dickhead Picori who picked up a magic hat and does evil things out of curiosity. He lacks the charm of Girahim, the otherworldly terror of Majora, and the genuine fear of Ganon, a hulking mass of a beast that you have to take down, an imposing figure of a man in all of his incarnations that will never, ever stay down. Vati doesn't scare me. At most, he's B-grade villainy. The end of the game feels really abrupt. They restore the victims of Vati's rampage, and Ezlo barely even acknowledges the bad things Vati did. Things just end. You stop Vati, and they end. That's it. Wonderful. Zelda is made of stone for the entire run, so it's not like you can bond with her, and while Ezlo is one of the funnier Zelda characters, I don't think there are enough moments to sell me on his character being anything other than mildly amusing. Certainly nothing on the level of Midna here, especially considering their parallels. Midna actually has a stake in the story that is explained well, and I sympathized with her plight because of it. When you storm the castle and confront Zant, there's some baggage there to unpack that's built up throughout the game's run. Midna failed her kingdom. She seems nervous to travel back and face that shame head on. It takes Link's courage and Zelda's sacrifice to put her on the right path. Ezlo technically has a stake in the plot because he had a connection to Vati and created the hat that can apparently manipulate reality, but because that connection wasn't explored at all, it leaves the story with almost no personal stakes. For God's sakes, the King of Red Lions had more of a stake in the story of the Wind Waker. He had a beautiful little arc learning to let go of the past and embrace the children of the future, breaking the vicious cycles of old that he helped perpetuate. I've said in the past that I don't really care much for Zelda's story, and that's still true, I don't need a Zelda game to have an outstanding cast or an engaging plot. I love the Oracle games, even though I don't give a flying fuck about their stories, but that doesn't mean I'm not disappointed when a potentially interesting story setup is botched so hard, especially in a series that has shown it can be thematically rich. I raise the Minish Cap as a bit of a bumbling mess, a game that is at some points overly complicated, and at other points stupefyingly simple. There are moments of brilliance in the overworld, in some of the dungeons, in its main mechanic, and especially its aesthetic elements that soothe and awe me to no end. There are so many moments where I wanted to love the Minish Cap, but the overwhelming majority of it baffled me. What is the point of Kinstones? 
Why do some of these dungeons feel like glorified hallways? Why doesn't the story explore some of its more interesting elements instead of playing out like a standard adventure story? Why can I not just give you all of these seashells at once? There were moments playing the Minish Cap where I had almost convinced myself that I loved it because it was a fresh new Zelda experience and I wanted to be enjoying myself a hell of a lot more. It was only upon thinking about it for a while, playing a bit more of it, reflecting on my emotions throughout, that I realized it was quite underwhelming in various areas. I didn't even really have my expectations set very high, I was just surprised by how often it was recommended to me, and I was intrigued by some of the talked about mechanics. In that sense, the size shifting didn't let me down, but almost everything else did. I know this will be a controversial take, but I did think for quite a while before I came to this conclusion just so I could be sure. I loved Link's Awakening in both of the Oracle games, and I know those are both fairly popular opinions. I'm not trying to go against the grain here, I just don't get the Minish Cap. It doesn't speak to me, and that's a mighty, or might I say, a puny disappointment. Allow me to give thanks to a few select patrons. Dominic Genjon Langla, Lucas Waldeck, Escanor, TJ, Julian Rivers, Logan Cavalier, Dan Russell, Lord Arceus, Vitros, Nicholas Amond, Chuck Harkins, B. Shimon, My Own Father, Puris Bordeaux, Duke091, and Christopher Knoll. If you liked the video, comment down below your thoughts on the game, on the video itself, as long as there's discussion going that's relevant in the comments below, I'll be a happy boy. My name is Ben King K, and I certainly hope you have some well-deserved fun today. <laughs>